Well, welcome to the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. I'm Scott Stevenson, President and CEO. We are here for a special virtual walking tour of George Washington's Philadelphia, just in the few blocks uh, surrounding us here at 3rd and Chestnut Streets. I am joined by two distinguished gentlemen, Talmadge Boston, it's confusing because it's Talmadge Boston of Dallas <laughs> on my one hand, and historian and author David O. Stewart on my other hand here. And we are building our conversation today around David's new book, George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father. And we're going to be walking and talking and exploring the history of George Washington's engagement with the historic Philadelphia location that we're in today. We've uh, had a chance to wander through a little bit of uh, historic Philadelphia, the neighborhood around the Museum of the American Revolution, which is located at 3rd and Chestnut Street. So just two blocks from Independence Hall in one direction and two blocks to Penn's Landing and the Delaware River in the other. This is in the center of what was sometimes known as the Athens of America. It is a place where the presence of the past is always surrounding you. And uh, we're really looking forward to our conversation today about George Washington, his connections to Philadelphia, and wherever else we decide uh, to go. So welcome, David. Thank welcome, Talmadge. We're glad to be here. <laughs> well, David, the first place we went on our walk was Independence Hall, and that's where George Washington secured his first two major appointments at the Second Continental Congress, where he was named head of the Continental Army for the Revolutionary War, and secondly, of course, the Constitutional Convention. But for that, that first one, the Second Continental Congress, uh, he was chosen unanimously by the delegates the there. So what did they know about him or what did they think about him that caused them unanimously to say, he's the guy we want to lead the army? And it was one month after Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world. So the war had already begun. Yeah, unanimous doesn't happen easily, and uh, certainly not today, but not even then. Mm -hmm. He benefited from a number of factors. One was he, he had military experience in the French and Indian War. It wasn't great. It was not sort of unrelieved victories, but he had been in battle. He had shown great bravery, and he had a reputation as a military person, and he wore his militia uniform around Philadelphia. So he reminded everybody of that. Uh, he also was on all their military committees. The Second Continental Congress knew they were going to war, and he was helping people figure out how do we get gunpowder? They didn't have enough. How do we make bullets? And things that he'd had to struggle with, and he had some expertise which they, they valued. He also had personal qualities which came through. He was a big guy. He was 6'3". Six 6'3", three. Six three back then, was big. And he had a wonderful presence, uh, a dignity, a calm, which is very attractive in a crisis. Uh, and he was a hard worker. We mm -hmm. sometimes lose track of the fact that this was a man who spent his whole life putting in 12 and 14 hour days. <laughs> um, but there also was some politics, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> The army that was outside of Boston that had been gathered to uh, surround the British was New Englanders. And there was a lot of anxiety among New Englanders that the rest of the colonies wouldn't be committed to the cause the way they needed to be to win the war. And so they were looking for somebody from the rest of the country. Virginia was perfect because it's the biggest colony, it's the most populous colony, it's got a lot of money. And here's this guy from Virginia. And he fit, he checked all the boxes for the things they were looking for. In addition to which you have to acknowledge, there wasn't a lot of great competition. <laughs> we did not have great soldiers in the country then. We had not much military tradition. So um, we, everything worked just right. Well, in the book, in your wonderful book, you talk about this quality he had, the ability to inspire trust. Now, you've already touched on some of the things that would create a great first impression, but you also talk in the book about how he was not a great speaker. He had a soft voice, almost breathy. Mm. 
So it's hard to imagine somebody who can inspire trust, who doesn't really have the, the, the power of rhetoric or eloquence like an Abraham Lincoln did, for example. Yeah, it, it was uh, uh, the, the presence thing I talked about in particular. Uh, he always looked good. He was very fussy about his clothes. He was turned out well. And a feature we tend to forget is, and people at the time commented on, I was surprised by, he was affable. He was easy to get along with. He was, you might just say today, a nice guy. He was courteous. Um, without being flip or sort of a lightweight. And that helps. He had an emotional intelligence, an ability to connect with people, uh, which came through and, and served him well through his career. It's something he learned to do. I mean, he was always tall. <laughs> he was always athletic. But he had to learn to do Well, I was just say, one of the things we like to emphasize here, another element of, um, I think, uh, in influencing the way Washington was seen and winning over the trust of people who were not naturally drawn together as thinking of themselves as part of a fledgling nation is his persistence in the field, remaining in the tented field. And as you know, one of our treasures here at the museum is Washington's command tent, the, we sometimes call the first Oval Office. And uh, a lot of the research that we've done, uh, this great uh, watercolor that we acquired a few years ago showing the Verplanck's Point encampment at the end of the Revolutionary War, showing Washington deliberately placing himself in situations where soldiers saw him in the tented field with them. And first and foremost, winning over the army to see that he was not someone who was going to, you know, be... Um, absent uh, when they were in their most difficult moments. Through the, their winter camps, which were miserable, mm -hmm. he stayed with them until after Yorktown. Mm -hmm. In 1781, he'd been in the field for six years. He did take that winter off and came to Philadelphia <laughs> yeah. with Martha. Yeah. But until then, he never left the army. When he was at Valley Forge and there was trouble at Congress, which was in York, I think, at the time, mm -hmm. um, he could have gone to see... Congress, it wasn't that far, but he never was going to leave the army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the soldiers valued that, and they knew that he was, he cared. Yeah. Now, it's one thing to be physically present at all times, <laughs> that has meaning. But to be the boss, to be a successful boss, you've got to have command presence, the stuff of command. So, David, you talked on some of the components that made him such a commanding presence. But is there any other characteristic that stands out that caused men to want to follow him? Hmm. He, he was re ex remarkably brave, and when you're going into battle, that matters. Hmm. But the, he had another quality which he fought against, which is he had what you might call a high temper. Hmm. And he, he could lose his temper. <laughs> he tried not to. And the times when he did, people spoke of with awe. Because Monmouth. This, this large guy really popping his cork was memorable. Yeah. But what I find also probably maybe more persuasive is if you're with a large person who is struggling to control his temper, that's almost more intimidating. <laughs> so, wow. I, 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 maybe I'll back off here. Um, so I think there was an element um, of, you know, he, there was a suppressed violence in him, which mm -hmm. you saw in battle. Mm -hmm. It was no longer suppressed, uh, which was part of his personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure thing. Now, after the war ended, a few years go by, and then we have the Constitutional Convention at Independence Hall. And Washington was again unanimously chosen by his peers to serve as the chairman. Now initially, as your book points out, he didn't really want to go to the convention. <laughs> or he said he didn't. And his good friend, Nobody best friend- Nobody wants to go to another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> his great friend James Madison begs him to come. He comes. So David, fellow lawyer, let me ask you a hypothetical question. Let's assume Washington had not gone to the Constitutional Convention and had not served as chairman. What impact do you think that would have had on the convention? Well, there's at least three ways it would have prevented the United States from being formed. <laughs> and I think one of them probably would have happened. Uh, one is that the convention just would have been a dud. 
You know, they had tried to call a convention in Annapolis for nine months before, and nobody came. Uh, five states sent delegates, totally 13 people. They, they couldn't even have a business meeting. They just got together and wrote an appeal to have the next convention, which was the one here in Philadelphia. So that was a real possibility. If Washington wasn't coming, that a lot of people would have just said, well, the heck with it. It's not going to work. Without his presence in the room, that wonderful phrase from the Miranda musical, being in the room where it happens, Washington is the leader. He is the person who reminds them of the sacrifices of the revolution. He is the guy who is implicitly saying, if you can agree to a constitution, a new form of government, I will make it happen. I will be the first president. They, all, they write about it. They all know that he will be the first president. If he's not there, if he's not making that implicit promise, maybe they don't agree. There's a lot of things they argue about, including slavery, that they don't get along with. And then the last problem, the last set of rocks they could have foundered on, was, of course, the ratification, which was not a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. You had states where it wasn't that popular to have the Constitution. And he was the whole card mm -hmm. in those state debates whenever they had a problem and they weren't going to get ratification, somebody would pop up and say, you know, Washington's behind this. I mean, this happens in the Virginia convention when Patrick Henry is, he, he's winning over the convention and he makes a mistake and he says, well, you know, Jefferson doesn't like this constitution. <laughs> Big mistake, because Madison pops up and says, well, there's another man just as great who does. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And he, actually, it's another man who's greater. <laughs> and everybody remembers, okay, yeah, it's Washington. Mm -hmm. So without Washington's support, I think there is a better than even chance that the Constitution just doesn't happen. And getting back to your observation we talked about a few minutes ago in terms of his not being a great speaker, in fact, during the proceedings, he said almost nothing. Mm -hmm. But when the meetings adjourned, uh, one of the... Uh, anecdotes is he was the enforcer of confidentiality mm. and and so anybody who was essentially breaking the mm. the spoken rules of the convention he was there to make sure that didn't happen again there there's an incident where somebody had taken a draft of the uh, resolutions they were debating and left them somewhere and they'd been turned into the teacher who was uh, the principal <laughs> who was Washington and at the end of a session he says I f was given this, someone lost track of it, and whoever has it will have to reclaim it. <laughs> this was not what we agreed to, and he throws it down on the table, and nobody claimed it. <laughs> 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 you didn't want to f admit to that one. Now, one of the most famous artifacts uh, of the convention is the chair where Washington sat, mm -hmm. uh, the Rising Sun chair. Mm -hmm. And uh, David, tell the story about Ben Franklin's comment on the importance of that chair. Well, Franklin was a powerful force for agreement and collegiality at the convention. Uh, he was the figure who came closest to Washington in eminence. And at the end, and he's got a wonderful sense of metaphor and timing and place, he, he comments, it's an unofficial comment just to colleagues, mm. you know, I have watched this, looked at this chair throughout the proceeding, and there's a replica here. And <laughs> we just end. sat in it. <laughs> yes, and it's uh, got a, a, a sun, the rays bursting out of it uh, at the top. And Franklin says, I have wondered if it was a rising or a setting sun. I now know that it's a rising sun, because mm -hmm. all of the delegates were going to sign the Constitution. And that helped everybody feel good about the Constitution, and we are still retelling the story, so he obviously <laughs> was a great natural publicist. Yeah. And yeah. we're still visiting the chair. The original two blocks away, but <laughs> you can't sit in that one. Come to the Museum of the there Revolution. You go. During our walk this morning, the second place we mm. went are the remnants of the mm. president's house, mm. which is where Washington lived during most of his presidency, and he held his uh, cabinet meetings there. Mm -hmm. So talk about President Washington and the way he interacted with his cabinet. There were 
two things you had to live with as a member of Washington's, or a head of an executive department in his administration. He advanced the cabinet. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't something in a statute or in the Constitution. But the first one was Washington was the boss. And we have a wonderful description by Jefferson later in life as to what happened and anything that went out from a head of the department, like Jefferson or Hamilton or Edmund Randolph, if it was controversial, Washington had to see it first. And Jefferson said, I want to run it, my presidency that way too. So he, he was familiar with this from his military experience, chain of command, Mm -hmm. I'm the guy who has to, who will catch the flack if it goes bad, mm -hmm. so I'm going to see it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing was, and this is when he develops the cabinet, which takes a year or two before it really is functioning the way we think of it, uh, he always had a desire, and he was very modest about his, he had not a great education, and as you say, he was not a great speaker. Um, he wanted smart people around him and he wanted the benefit of their thinking. He did this as a judge on the Fairfax County Court when he sat on bond with other judges and they decided cases collegially. He did it as a military commander. He would have councils of war and he would listen to eight or 10 or 12 uh, generals and have them give written advice. And he did it in the government through the cabinet. And he had the great blessing because he managed to recruit Hamilton and Jefferson, pretty smart guys. And he wanted to know what they thought about all the hard decisions he had to make. Now, he knew he would make the decision. He never went with the majority. Hmm. I mean, he might, but that wasn't the issue. It was who made the most sense to him, hmm. who helped him understand the issue best. And they got testy. And, you know, the, you sort of feel sympathetic for Jefferson because Hamilton, and Jefferson writes about this, uh, would talk for 45 minutes without essentially breathing. And Jefferson disliked argument, so he would just sort of flatly state his position and let it go. So it was, in terms of airtime, it, yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a little yeah. one-sided, but Washington wanted yeah. to hear from both. He yeah. wanted to know what different minds thought about these hard problems. And uh, it, it's a great model of decision making. Well, from the beginning of the time that Hamilton and Jefferson are in the cabinet through the rest of Washington's presidency, with each passing day, it seemed they be became more bitter enemies than they had the day before. But they were uh, able to agree on one thing, and that was the Compromise of 1790. And that was where uh, an agreement was made uh, involving two critical issues that they couldn't figure out. Issue number one, where to locate the permanent home for the federal government, uh, which turned out to be near Virginia. And the second was for the federal government to assume the debts that each of the states had from the war. That was the, the trade. So what was Washington's role in bringing about the Compromise of 1790 in the context of Hamilton and Jefferson as being on opposite sides of the issues? Yeah, historians have been very distracted, I think, by an account written by Jefferson of a, of a dinner. <laughs> and I accept that the dinner probably happened. Uh, and it was the room where it happened. Um, but Madison, who was the leader in Congress on behalf of the administration, he'd been Washington's closest political confidant for four or five years, was there for the legislative branch. And Jefferson and Hamilton are there, and they do hammer out this compromise. But I think what people have tended to miss is they were all working for the boss. Hmm. You, know, Washington, you know, Washington appointed Hamilton and Jefferson. They served at his pleasure. He could uh, dismiss them. And Madison was his closest legislative ally. So they are figuring out this hard problem. It's a very complex political balance between where will this seat of government be on a temporary basis, it ends up here in Philadelphia, on a permanent basis, it ends up in Potomac. The assumption of the debts is controversial. Some states paid their debts, they don't want to see them assumed. Other states haven't paid their debts, they really want to see them assumed. <laughs> and it is ultimately resolved, as you suggest, where the debts are assumed, Hamilton wins that. 
the uh, uh, seat of government goes to the Potomac. That's what Jefferson wants. But what people seem to overlook is there's only one guy who got everything he wanted, and that's the boss. George Washington wanted the seat of government on the Potomac, and he wanted the debts assumed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a wonderful saying in Latin, I'll probably butcher it, but cui bono, who benefits, mm -hmm. is the question you ask. Well, Washington got what he wanted. Mm -hmm. So I think we just have to recognize this was his compromise, and he's the guy who made it happen. Mm -hmm. The last place we went on our walk this morning was to Congress Hall, mm -hmm. and that's where Congress met during Washington's presidency. Mm -hmm. It's also where Washington had his second inauguration and gave the shortest inaugural address <laughs> in the history of the presidency, 135 words, two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. So, David, what was Washington's attitude as he started his second term? He didn't want to be president for a second term. Uh, he understood and, and foresaw politically that it was going to be worse, that uh, partisanship was growing. Uh, and he was tired. He served a long time, and he really liked being in Mount Vernon, so he would have preferred that. Um, all of his friends on either side of the partisan divide told him he had to serve, and he was a man who believed in doing your duty. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize he also was not without ego or vanity. It probably f felt good for somebody mm -hmm. to say, we must have you. So he agreed to serve a second term, but he was grumpy about it. He got over it. He had to serve those four years. But it is an extraordinary uh, inaugural address. It is the shortest one ever. It, it's not mm -hmm. civil. It, it's mm -hmm. kind of rude. Mm -hmm. and, and I think people ought to read it because you get a sense for um, he he didn't sugarcoat things mm -hmm. and he let people know that he wasn't happy about it. Now, four years later, John Adams was inaugurated there mm -hmm. at Congress Hall. Mm -hmm. And of course, Washington was there. And, and when it's over, what's Washington's state of mind as mm -hmm. he leaves Congress Hall and it's time to go home to Virgin, uh, Mount Vernon? Mm -hmm. he's, he's a sentimental guy who... I mentioned briefly his emotional connectedness with people. He was not shy about showing his emotions. And it was a big moment. He is walking away from the work of his life. He has had extraordinary opportunities. He's done extraordinary things, and he knows it. And so he's leaving the building, and there are people waiting for him. There's a big crowd. And they're quiet. Nobody's shouting out, hey, General, you know, huzzah for Washington. They're all sad that he's leaving. Mm -hmm. And he walks to the president's house. It's only a block. But they all follow him, and they follow him in silence, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. just a remarkable thing. I think actors will tell you that when you finish a performance and the crowd is silent for a minute, mm -hmm. that means you've re touched them, you've reached mm -hmm. them, and that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And he gets to the front steps, mm -hmm. We turns, walked that very path a little bit earlier today. The steps are gone. <laughs> they are. <laughs> but they've done a good job showing us what was there. And yeah. he turns to the crowd, and it is the moment to say something. But clearly the words wouldn't come to him. He was too emotional. And all he could do was wave. And um, it, it, it is a, a powerful uh, moment to, to imagine. And uh, I, I think it it fits his, his character and personality. Mm -hmm. Well, Scott, we've sure uh, enjoyed talking yeah. about uh, George Absolutely. Washington's Philadelphia. We appreciate the museum giving us this wonderful opportunity. And David's book, by the time it's shown, is going to be out in the paperback edition, which I'm sure will be on sale in your gift shop. So you bet. Yeah. <laughs> I got an advanced copy here, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and it's, I think, a great reminder that. Um, you know, there's people all around the country, all around the world who absolutely consume works like yours, David. Um, what we try to encourage people to do is to actually come and visit the place. And I think in Philadelphia, of all of the, the spaces, with perhaps the exception of Mount Vernon, you know, it's a place where you can still really feel the presence of a, of a, a, a place that meant so much to Washington. You know, when he, when he left um, after uh, the inauguration of Adams. That was about 40 years uh, after his first <laughs> yeah. visit to Philadelphia and so much of his 
personal and professional public career had intersected with just a few blocks around where we're, we're sitting here. And so I encourage everyone to, to make a pilgrimage here to Philadelphia and uh, feel the presence of Washington.